Hi there. I'm in the beautiful Crichton Gardens recording this and it's, it's early evening and the birds are singing. You'll probably hear them now and then. And there's people walking dogs and I can hear some bees huzz buzzing behind me and it's just a beautiful place <laughs> for birds. <laughs> it's really lovely. And I wanted to ask you today, how are you doing? This is one of the questions that we ask each other a lot. We, you know, when you meet people, you always say, hi, how are you doing? Or if you're in Australia, you say, how are you going? But in the these days of lockdown and isolation, being online, this non-contact church, it's a, it's a bigger question, isn't it? How are you doing? In the third letter of John, verse 2, it says this, Beloved, I pray that you would prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's a lovely uh, thing that is written to say, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be whole. I want you to prosper just as your soul prospers. So I'm asking you this morning, how are you doing? We've just sung a modern version of a very old hymn and I want to read the words of this hymn to you and then tell you about it. It says, When peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless state and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. There's a story to that hymn and the man who wrote it, and you've maybe heard it before, but bear with me, I'd like you to hear it again. It's a story of faith that belonged to the man called Horatio Spafford, who lived in 1828 to about 1888. And he was a bit like Job. He placed his trust in God during his life's prosperity, but also during its calamities. He was a devout Christian and he immersed himself in scripture and many of the years of his life were really good, prosperous and healthy. He was a, a prominent Chicago lawyer and he's, he had a thriving business, owned several properties throughout the city. He had a, a beautiful wife and four beautiful daughters and a, a, very, a son he was very proud of. And actually, he would say it himself, life was good, he was blessed. But just as Horatio hit the pinnacle of his profession and his financial successes, things began to change. It began with the tragic loss of their son. And then not long after that, there was the Chicago, the great Chicago fire and it destroyed ne nearly every real estate investment that Horatio had owned. Just a few years later, in 1873, Horatio decided to treat his wife and daughters to a much needed escape from the turmoil. He sent them on a boat trip to Europe and he had plans to join them later. He had business that he needed to take care of and so they went on ahead of him. Just a few days later, he received a telegram from his wife, an awful telegram. It said, saved alone. And it bore the excruciating news that the family's ship had been wrecked and all four of his daughters had perished. As Horatio made his way to meet his heartbroken wife, he passed over the same sea that had just claimed the lives of his remaining children. And it was then 
that he put pen to paper and wrote that hymn. And so, yes, it's good to ask, how are you doing? But more importantly, I want to ask you this morning, how is your soul? There's been much in the media and in talk recently about what we're all doing to stand against racism, against poverty, to play our part, to campaign against this or that, to march for or to uh, comment on social media what our stance is, and to play our part in staying safe through COVID. And of course now the, the rules are changing slightly and no longer is it stay home and protect the NHS, it's stay safe, protect others and save lives. And it, it really is good to be active and knowledgeable about these current affairs, to know what we believe about them. But you know, I do believe that we need to take a bit of a check on ourselves. Rather than just getting embroiled in the causes that the media has a heyday with, when we get involved and try to understand all the permutations of the current culture and its speak, it's really easy to let that become the main purpose in our life. And you find your passion for God and his cause becomes secondary to the cause that's prevalent at the moment. How are you doing with it all? How's your soul? Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You see, if your soul, your heart, isn't settled and sorted, then the issues of life will overwhelm you, and you get distracted, and life becomes out of kilter. And I think sometimes it's good to just sit before God and take stock. Let him show you how things are in your life. I've been looking at Psalm 139 a lot lately. And it says this, verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, know my anxious thoughts. In the Passion Translation, it says it like this, God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. See if there's any path of pain that I'm walking on and lead me back to your glorious, everlasting ways, the path that brings me back to you. You know, if we go digging into our lives and looking introspectively into the deep things of our soul, I'm sure we'll find stuff and stuff that's not very nice. And it, it really can make you very insecure and feel condemned and, and lead to despair that we'll never get the right perspective. But you know, when you allow God to sift your heart, he comes with that gentle but firm and constructive help that says, I'll lift you out of this despair. I'll lift you out of the miry clay, the Bible tells us, and set your feet upon the rock, him, himself. And he helps us think of ourselves and the life issues that are going on around about us from his point of view. Doesn't mean we don't care about the current social situations, but it does mean that we get more of an eternal view a godly view and because our soul is well and fixed upon him we're a lot more able to discern what he wants us to take up and pursue hearing and reacting to media news world views and popular opinion <laughs> it isn't necessarily healthy for you and it's so often slanted and sometimes just not even right. I think we need to have the eyes of heaven to view some of these things 
with the right perspective, with the right angle and the right heart that doesn't overwhelm us and drag us down and cause us to despair as to what we could ever do and nothing seems to change. There's a wonderful song in the movie Prince of Egypt, Look at Life Through Heaven's Eyes. It says, a single thread in a tapestry, though its colour brightly shine, can never see its purpose in the pattern of the grand design. And the stone that sits at the very top of the mountain's mighty face, does it think it's more important than the stones that form the base? So how can you see what your life is worth or where your values lie? You can never see through the eyes of man. You must look at your life. Look at your life through heaven's eyes. I love that song and I bet you're all thinking of it and singing it and humming it now in your head. But looking at life through heaven's eyes is not just getting a broader overview and all that. It's learning to look at our life, all lives, through the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Because only He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and He sees it all, all the way through. And all the details that of everybody's lives and the complicated things of history and today and what will be. So I come back to ask you, how's your soul? Is it right with God, first and foremost? Are you secure in your salvation, knowing that Jesus is your Lord and your Saviour? Are you right with yourself? Do you know who you are and how precious you are to God? And thirdly, are you right with how you see others and the world at large through the lenses of God's love and his value of every individual person? Or are you swinging on the branch of current views? You know, sometimes our heart has been damaged by life situations, by people's words. And no matter how much we bolster ourselves up by saying, I don't care what people think, we do. And it sometimes goes down so deep that we bury that down there. And those words that we have had said about us, that we have said about ourselves, that we've said about others, that we've accepted because it's popular and the media is flashing it at us all the time, they sometimes get written in our heart. And then what's written there comes out of us. Proverbs 4 and verse 23 says, Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Proverbs is full of Solomon's wisdom. And he often talks about writing things on the tablet of your heart or keeping them in the middle of your heart. Proverbs 3, Proverbs 4, Proverbs 6 and Proverbs 7 are full of these things. Write them, store them, keep them in your heart. And you know, when words and situations and life's mess has done stuff to us that hurts and makes us feel less than. There are th sometimes things that we hear that bring up the hurt and the damage that's already done in our hearts. Words, reminders, and it, it sort of reinforces what's written there. And, and I suppose it's as if our faith gets dulled. It gets heavy and blocked up. Sometimes it's of our own making, but it can also be what others have done, said, and maybe inadvertently because they're wounded too. And they put things on us, almost shoveled soil into our well, as it were. In, in Genesis 26, we read that Isaac had to reopen wells that had been blocked up that had been open and functioning years before. It says, the Philistines 
filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. And these were the wells that had been dug by his servants of his father, Abraham. And then in verse 18, 17, it goes, Isaac moved away to the Gera Valley where he set up tents and settled down and he reopened the wells that his father had dug that the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death and he restored the names that Abraham had given them. You know, sometimes there are Philistines in our life that clog up our wells. There are people or events or situations that overwhelm us. Things like disappointment, discouragement, distractions are well cloggers and they clog up your well-being. And maybe I'm playing with words here, but well-being, a being well, is your well full? Is it unclogged? You know, people built towns and villages around wells because it was a source of life and they moved on when the well dried up or when it got clogged up they went and dug other wells. Maybe our well-being is not so well if we're clogged up in many different areas. Isaiah 12 says with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. But if your well's clogged up, it's very hard to draw water from it and find the joy which sustains us, gives us that joy and gives us strength for life. And you know, it's okay to recognize these, to admit, I am disappointed. I've been discouraged. I've been easily distracted. Maybe admitting that you've been disappointed by people or even that you feel disappointed by God. He didn't come in when you wanted him to and he didn't do it in your time scale or it's been such a long time waiting for what you believed God said he was going to do. And you're still waiting. You know, he knows. And I think it's time to let him in to heal those hurt areas, to admit, yeah, I am hurt, I am disappointed, and I'm clogged up because I can't get past this. And just like I said before, when God comes and reveals things of hurt, disappointment, pain, things that are wrong in our lives, he does it gently. He doesn't come with condemnation. He doesn't come with criticism and a, well, you should have known better. Not at all. He comes and says, now here, this is the problem. Let's sort it and let's walk out of this freely. Maybe you're discouraged. Admit that you're discouraged. It's been a hard time this lockdown and maybe your discouragement began before that and it's just filled up the well a little bit more. Don't allow it to fill it up anymore and clog up your life support and your life supply. It may be that you just can't see the way ahead. It's all just been more than you can cope with at the moment. And somehow the Philistines of discouragement have clogged up your well and the joy's not there anymore. Maybe you've been on a detour, distracted, distracted from the main thing of walking with God and now you're feeling a bit out of it, maybe even a bit lost, sad. In these areas and probably other things that we can call Philistines, they've come and poured gunge into your well and you're tired and heavy with it. Let's go back to Psalm 139 because the first few verses say this, Lord you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and my soul and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me Lord. You read my heart like an open book and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I take before my journey begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. 
and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. So how can we unclog or repair our wells, our wellspring of life? How's your soul doing? It's simply, it always is, we complicate things so much. It's simply coming to God with a humble heart and asking him to lead you into healing and release that fresh water once again to unclog the well, to let that wellspring bubble up again and dislodge what the Philistines have put there. He's the God who heals and restores. And as we allow ourselves time with God to let him search our hearts and to know us deeply, then those things that have stumbled us, dried us up and stifled our life flow will be cleared out and restoration and rebuilding will come. I want to leave you with a couple of scriptures that have meant a great deal to me over the last number of years. They're both in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30, starting at verse 16. And it says, Therefore all those who devour you shall be devoured. And all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. All that discouragement, all that hurt, all that pressure to perform, pressure to be seen, to be doing the right thing in the eyes of people today. We have to sign this petition. We have to comment on social media. We have to be seen to be standing up what, for what everybody else is standing up for. All these things shall go into captivity and those who plunder you shall become plunder and all who pray upon you I will make a prey. For, says the Lord, I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds. I love that. And further on in Jeremiah 31, verses, from verse 3, it says, The Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I've drawn you. Again, I will build you and you will be rebuilt, O Virgin of Israel. And you shall again be adorned with your tambourines and shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. Now, isn't that something that our clogged up wells long for, that we would go out with joy and dancing and strength and hope and peace and know that healing and restoration that makes us say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I want to pray for you that God will come to you as you allow him to search you and as you relinquish your bunged up wells to him, that he'll restore health to you and heal you of your wounds and rebuild you. Shall we pray? Lord, I pray for each one that feels like they're clogged up, that they are stuck, that the wellspring of life has just become clogged and heavy and there's no joy in walking with you at this time. And I pray for each one, Lord, that sort of dares to admit, that's me, I've felt clogged up, I've felt like I ought to be rejoicing and I ought to be doing well, but I'm not. And Father, I pray for each and every one that sort of feels like that and can recognize themselves and say, I'm not doing very well actually, my soul isn't at peace. Maybe that you've not made peace with God, that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the first place to make him your Lord and Saviour. And all you need to do is say, Lord, I'm a mess. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for promising me life as I come to you and I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord and my Saviour. It may be 
that you've been distracted and chasing after other things and God has become a bit secondary, then humble yourself and return to him. Same prayer, forgive me Lord. Restore life to me again. And it may be that you just know that you've bottled things up, you've clogged things there, and you need God's touch on your life to release you. So Lord, we just pray right now for each one that feels clogged up, that Lord, you would unbung them, show them what the problem is, and then do what you've said in your word. Restore health to them, heal them of their wounds, and rebuild their lives. And Father, we pray that you would begin this right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. A single thread in a tapestry, though its color brightly shine, can never see its purpose in the pattern of the grand design. And the stone that sits on the very top of the mountain's mighty face does it think it's more important than the stones that form the base? So how can you see what your life is worth or where your value lies? You can never see through the eyes of man. You must look at your life. Look at your life through heaven's eyes.